Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome to another K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. By the way, K-Cups come in three sizes, single, double, and triple shots, or roughly one minute, five minutes, or 10 minutes in length. So if you don't have time to throw back an entire caffeinated career conversation, these K-Cup mini episodes of T4C can give you a quick caffeinated fix, whether you're on the go or you only have a few minutes to binge. So grab your mug and take a chug, because it's time for a caffeinated career triple shot K-Cup with my guest, Michael Solomon. As I mentioned in the introduction, some of your clients include marquee names like Amex, Google, Verizon, and Yelp. And when I saw that, I was actually really surprised because I was thinking, why are these big corporations coming to you for your services? I get why the smaller companies would be because they may not have a robust recruiting team. Why can't the big companies find their own tech rock stars? Many of the big tech companies are doing just fine in that, but the reality of the overall industry is the level of people at the top, the people who are 10Xers, as we call them, and I should define that term, there are people who literally deliver 10 times the value of other people. It doesn't always mean that literally, but I can actually give you examples where we have seen that in practice. And these people at the top of the food chain, they're not a gazillion of them out there and everybody needs them. So yes, the FANG companies, which is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Apple. Yeah, I think I got all all the letters in there. Yes, they have wonderful recruiting. They're bringing in people all the time. They don't need as much help. Although sometimes they come to us because we have people ready to go. It's a factor of speed. You can come in the door on a Tuesday morning. If you know exactly what you want, we can show you a profile. And we can have somebody spun up and working within days. We've done it within hours when there's a real emergency, but that is part of what people are coming to us for. Got it. So since you've defined what it means to be 10X, why don't we talk about your new book, Game Changer, How to Be 10X in the Talent Economy. What is the talent economy, Michael? And what does it encompass so we we've, we've seen a transition over time and I, I don't want to go too far back and turn it into a history lesson, but we've had the industrial and the agricultural revolutions. We're now having the information age. And really what we're seeing at this point is labor is going away. And this is this is a little bit of a controversial topic, but jobs are evaporating because of automation, because of AI. There are going to be fewer and fewer jobs that machines can't do. And that means there's going be fewer and fewer jobs that humans can do. And by the way, coronavirus has accelerated this trend tremendously, which is not great. And what you have left is you still need people, right? But you need people who are incredible at what they do. And because you need to do more with less, everybody's looking for these 10Xers. And we, you know, when you think of the talent economy, you can also think of the knowledge economy. These are people who are exceptional. These are people who are great. This is not the gig economy. The gig economy only speaks to sort of the duration of an engagement. And the gig economy also, in my estimation, is really just a rest stop on the highway between the employed world we've had for the last hundred or so years and the future where there aren't going to be jobs for everyone. But the knowledge workers and the knowledge economy, that's going to keep going. The people with the most talent are going to always be in demand. The book really gets into two categories. There's how do you manage and attract people like this? What are they looking for? And then the second half of the book is how do you make yourself more 10x? How do you improve yourself quickly so that you can compete in this crazy competitive landscape? I'd like us to focus on the second half of that. The I part cuz I think that is probably where most of our listeners are. They're not yet managing certainly large numbers of people and I think our listeners would really benefit, Michael, hearing about what you think it takes to be 10x and why that's so important. I get the fact that the gig economy, in your estimation, is just a rest stop. I'm not as sold on the idea that 
you have to be 10x to make it in this economy right now. And I'd love to hear more. Oh, no, I agree that right now you don't have to be, but the job roles are going to continue to tighten and tighten. And as that happens, the room that's left is going to be for the best performers. We're, we're not there yet. So if I misstated that at all, I'll just allow that to be a correction. I think the best way to approach this is to start out by saying, like, what do 10Xers have in common? And the reason we wrote the book is we've had these experiences now managing talent across multiple sectors. So just to explain what I mean by that. So we've managed musicians, we've managed music producers and music writers, we've managed directors, we've managed entrepreneurs, and we've managed all these technologists. So it's really, we haven't done any sports at all, but we really have a breadth of experience from people like John Mayer, who's absolutely a 10 Xer. And for that matter, we didn't manage him, but we worked very closely with Springsteen and his management, and they're all 10 Xers. So we we sort of like looked first in the entertainment industry of what is this? And then when we got into the technology industry, it became clear. Here are the things that we've observed as being traits of 10 Xers. They are, and some of this is going to sound familiar and obvious, and it's not. And you, when you put it all together and you start to package it up and you say, this is what I want to be, it's going to be very prescriptive for how to, how to build yourself and better yourself. So one thing is they love problem solving. The bigger, the harder the problem they are ready to dive in and go after it because they've solved problems. They know they can do it and they know how good it feels when they do it and they get addicted to that. And not to go out too far off on a tangent, but you know, when when people use the word hacker, so many hackers don't break into things to steal them or vandalize them. They literally just want to see if they can get in the door. They're not going to do anything. They just want to know like, am I good enough to get through the security? Sometimes those people even report how they got in. So problem solving is really big. Like being ambitious, wanting to take on big things. Personal mission becomes a much bigger thing than it ever was for. These people have choices. They want to work on things they care about, which might be a hard problem. And it also might be a societal issue that they really care about. They are lifelong learners. I don't know any of these people that aren't constantly learning new things. In the software world, they're learning new languages. I get emails regularly saying, I, you know, I just finished mastering this language. What should I do next? What's popular? What's coming? So they just constantly trying to better themselves. And as part of that, and they can all- I interrupt just for one second? Yeah. When you say yeah. languages, Michael, are you talking about foreign languages or are you talking about coding languages? Sorry. At that moment, I was referring to software languages. Got they it. also actually as a group, and I don't want to generalize too much, but the software engineers we work with mostly speak multiple languages. Most of them play instruments. Most of them do outdoor activities at like hiking and biking and and snowboarding, skiing. They're very well-rounded people. And I think that's another thing that I've seen of 10Xers is they want to live a robust life and they are focused on lifestyle as well as just work. So while I was referring to software languages, it could be anything else. I'm going to say at least a dozen times I've had a client say, yeah, I'm actually picking up Spanish now or I'm picking up another language now as well as software languages. They're just interested in learning. And part of the interest in learning and part of what they understand is getting feedback. So they like, and I do not consider myself a 10 xer but I believe one of the most valuable things for me is being open to and solicitous of feedback from everybody around me that I work with. And it's not easy, by the way, because sometimes you hear things that you didn't know. I mean, hopefully they're things you didn't know. And also sometimes they're painful and you didn't realize that you were doing something that may have been offensive to a person. But you're constantly getting this information and it's a really great way to improve. So these are some of the common things that we see among this group. And by the way, a lot of those traits are actually pretty common among millennials and Gen Z too. And I don't think there's an accident. I think that the 10 Xers have sort of laid the blueprint for the younger generations. And so if that's where you want to go, if you want to be 10 X, here's what we found that they have in common, which is a pretty good roadmap for how you advance. I'll add one more quality to that, which is they suffer no fools. 10 Xers are not going to stick around because they have choices. If they're on a team with somebody who's destructive or or incompetent, and that person's going to be left on that team indefinitely, they're not going to stick around. It's too hard on them to have to deal with that. So there's a process in the book we describe called the manageability continuum. And on the one end, you've got the 10 Xers who have the success impulse, where they are literally making every choice 
that moves them in the direction of their goals. That's part of what makes them a 10 Xer. John Mayer was a great example of that. He was every choice he made just made him more successful and more of what he wanted with almost no exceptions. The other end of the spectrum is called the sabotage impulse. And these are people who don't really have the tools to move down the line. And I'll explain why. These are the people and everybody, whether it's in school or in your first job, you're going to encounter people who don't take responsibility for any mistakes. They run and hide when there's a mistake or they do something that you know, I've heard referred to as called a blame thrower, where in order to protect themselves, they start spreading the blame and pointing it at everyone else. <laughs> run from those people. Run. run or get rid of them if they're on your team. But like literally... Those people don't get better because the first thing you need to be able to get better is a realization that you have improvement to make. And if somebody gives you feedback and you deny that there was a mistake made or you deny that you have things that need to be worked on, you're not going to work on them and therefore you're not going to get any better. Mm -hmm. And 10 extras do not want to be around people like that because it's just too much lost energy and time. Thanks for tuning in to this K-Cup mini episode of Time for Coffee. If you want to listen to our entire caffeinated career conversation, please check out the show notes for this episode. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.